Mr. Fallon is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to follow up real quickly, Mr. Kitchen. Uh, yeah, I think ransomware is a, an issue that it's a huge problem already, and it's one that largely goes under the radar unless we, you know, a colonial pipeline is hit or something at JBS, and that's what everybody talked about it for a week and forgot about it and acted as if it's not a real problem, which it, it, it is when you have friends in industry, small companies, 100, 200 people that are getting hit. Um, half a million dollar ransoms now are being asked, or a million dollar ransoms when a lot of the time it was 50 grand a few years back. Do you think that with AI, are we going to face, as you just mentioned, but I want you to expound on it, like an explosion in ransomware when you say it's democratized? I, th th I think that's certainly one of the potential implications. I, I, honestly, I think one of the, the, the key developments over the last two years that has constrained ransomware to the degree that's been constrained is the war in Ukraine, that many of those uh, cyber syndicates that were prosecuting those attacks have been repurposed by the Russian government for attacks in Ukraine and, and elsewhere. I think if and when that ever slows down, we're going we're gonna to feel the, the, the surge again. Um, and I think that that surge will absolutely be enabled by generative AI because one of the key areas, uh, there's, there's a, a study that says that there are kind of four key areas uh, that will constitute approximately 75% of the economic increase coming with Gen AI. One of those is in R&D and in software development being the other. And so uh, I think that applies, unfortunately, equally to the bad guys as it does mm -hmm. the good guys. Yeah, you know, nobody has ever accused the DOD of being highly efficient. Um, they're, they're large, but uh, when you have in, in, uh, inefficiencies, you're talking about wasting billions of taxpayer dollars, uh, particularly when we're in a competition with China that's even more uh, troubling and we need to address it. Uh, we might envision AI with uh, future wars being fought by robots and such, but uh, within the walls itself, uh, these walls, uh, Mr. Wang, in your opinion, can the Department of Defense use AI to extract efficiencies in, in programming and budgetary activities? For sure. Uh, one of the areas that we've already worked with some of our uh, DoD customers on is using artificial intelligence and large language models to help digest uh, requirements that are given by the DoD. You know, there's so many groups within the Department of Defense that are generating requirements uh, and matching those requirements up with capabilities in the private sector or, or new capabilities that the DoD develops is, uh, is an incredible efficiency, potential efficiency gain. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of applications like that of artificial intelligence towards making the DoD a more efficient organization. So I'm incredibly optimistic about the ability to use AI, whether it's in logistics, back office, uh, you know, in personnel related matters to build a more efficient force that, you know, wastes fewer resources and ultimately uh, is able to have more force production capability. I think it's the same thing holds for, you know, increased accountability with DoD contracting and, and spending? Uh, I, I think that there's, you know, if you think about what the limitations are or what the challenges are, it's in processing huge amounts of information and data that is being generated by the DoD to, you know, understand not only how funds are being used, but also uh, understand what the capabilities that are being generated are. And so if you think about that problem set, it's one that's naturally suited for artificial intelligence and for, uh, for uh, the use of these large language models. Okay. Uh, doctor, you know, some, when you talk about AI, my mind starts to bend and, and, and hurt and break a little bit because it's just so uh, in, intriguing. Uh, but when we just talk about basic concepts of some of the... <laughs> the technology we've grown accustomed to, like with social media. Some folks, believe it or not, in this building and on the other side of the building, don't grasp even those, con I mean, I remember a, a major state's governor saying that we should use Twitter more. I didn't even get the name right. Uh, and it, one of the senators, I think, remember saying, like, how can they post a picture on the line? Things like that. So while that's funny, it's also troubling that if they're not grasping basic concepts and you talk about AI, which is this stuff on, you know, hypersteroids, uh, how do we go about best educating uh, our colleagues in the American public on uh, AI and assuage some of the fears associated with it? So when we are thinking about the the, tech, uh, the, the education side of it. Uh, we need to understand that this education needs to be tailored towards people's needs. So depending on their roles, depending on their responsibilities, we need to tailor that in education for them. To give you an example, for senior leaders who may not be technical, we need to come up with an education that lets them know what AI is exactly to your point, what it's capable of, what its limitations are. 
versus someone who's technical, let's say a data scientist. For them, that would be a different story. We can have a more technical e education for them, but also having this tech, uh, education in a continual form as AI evolves. So almost like how it can help them specifically and make their lives a little bit better. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Ryan is recognized for five minutes.